I'd be happy to call our meeting to order. Uh, the first item on the agenda is to uh, review and approve the minutes of the September 13th meeting. No, I've got no comments. No comments here either. Okay, I'd entertain a motion then. I move to approve the minutes from the previous meeting. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Uh, Fred? Aye. Uh, Julie? Yes. And me? Yes. Okay, very good. And then uh, next item on our agenda are the payroll warrants um, from last time. No comments here. None here either. Okay, very good. The, um, the next item is public comment. Uh, this is the time to listen to comments from the public related to items not listed on the agenda. And I see a couple of different names here. So uh, is there anybody here who would like to um, say anything either on Zoom or folks in the room? I think I can see a person or two there uh, in the room, although you're really small. So I might, uh, I might not have a full view. I see um there's I see a hand up in the middle of the room there. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, please uh, state your name and uh, and tell us what's on your mind. Hi Joyce, Robert Klinger. I am a library trustee. I'm here for that part of the agenda. Oh, but, okay. Um, while I'm here, if I have the opportunity to say something in front of the uh, powers that be in the town, there's two stop signs missing. Oh. One, at the bottom, one at the bottom of Dickinson Hill Road and at the intersection of Dickinson Hill and Haydenville. And then another okay. one at the bottom of Westbrook where it intersects Chestnut Plain. Yeah. There's no stop sign at either of those intersections. I, yeah. haven't seen, I haven't seen any close calls at the Westbrook Chestnut Plain intersection. Mm -hmm. But in, in the last six months, I've seen one at the bottom of Dickinson Hill Road and Haydenville and heard about another one. And both of them involved people from out of state coming down Dickinson Hill Road. Mm -hmm. There's no yeah. stop sign. And how do they yeah. know it's done? Yeah, I happen to know it was at Westbrook. Um, sign and wait. So it's not a missing stop sign. It might be a candidate for having a stop sign. But uh, as far as I know, stop sign that used to be there and then got taken down or stolen or run over or anything like that. I don't know if the same is true for Dickinson Hill and Haydenville Road. Does, uh, does anybody who's here happen to know about that intersection? No. Yeah. But I think that that's probably a question then for our um, superintendent of buildings and highways. Um, just walked in. Who just, oh, just walked in. in. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the answer to the question? No. <laughs> okay, great. Well, um, well, Keith, are you willing to take sort of an off the cuff question from the member of the public who's sitting pretty much right next to you there or maybe in front of you? Um, they're wondering about, um, I happen to know at the bottom of Westbrook Road near Chestnut Plain Road, there is no stop sign there. And I don't remember there ever being a stop sign there the whole time I've lived here. Um, and uh, and I guess the question might be why, maybe that should have a stop sign. Um, and the other intersection in question is the Dickinson Hill Road where it meets Haydenville Road. Um, uh, that uh, that our, uh, the member of the public who brought this up has seen at least some close calls there at the Dickinson Hill uh, Road where it kind of, I don't know if merge is the right word, but uh, where it moves in. Was that supposed to have a stop sign and it came down or do you have any any um, knowledge or wisdom to impart? Yeah, I can answer those questions and that is that both those locations Select board has never authorized stop signs to be at any of those intersections. There's nothing stopping the select board from doing that. Mm. 
those two intersections could very well they meet at right angles. They they're you know they're good candidates, and I agree that it would be probably in the best interest of the traveling public to have stop signs there. That's not a problem. Mm. So um I know with speed limit signs we have to kind of go through we have to get someone from the state to take a look and so on what's the process like for putting up a stop sign because i'm not a traffic engineer or a road engineer the board need to vote to authorize and that is basically so that it is enforceable by the police department i just go put up a stop sign and it has not been voted by the select board it's hmm. technically not enforceable by the police department Sure. So I understand that part of the process. But my question is, is it a good idea? You're saying in your opinion, like, you know, without having looked into it anymore, that you think it might be a good idea there. And that's, I assume, with your highway superintendent hat on. Um, do you have any idea why it does not have one now? I sort, of, I sort of feel like I'm the wrong person to ask where their stop sign belongs there, honestly. Because... There, no, Joyce, it's, it's one I'm of an electrical things. engineer, so, you know. <laughs> it's one of those things, Joyce, where it's not, um, it's never been, it's never been requested by anyone. Um, okay. I mean, there's other, there's other intersections that we have that could have them too, but. All right. I mean, if you want, I can give, make a list of maybe some other locations. But at the moment, for, as far as stop signs go, those two locations, and we could do both ends of Westbrook Road and the intersection of Dickinson Hill and Haydenville, those are prime locations. Okay, well, I, I guess having only thought about it for you know 30 seconds, I'd, I'd rather not just take a vote right now, but can we put this maybe on next meeting's agenda? And then that'll give you some time and maybe give us some time to, to think about at least those two intersections. And if there's some others, I mean, I haven't noticed a lot of other intersections in town with no stop signs. If I can, Brian, is there any state requirement that we talk to state DOT before coming up a stop sign in the way there is speed limit. I don't believe so. And does, would it require a public hearing? No. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much for speaking up. Are there any other me members of the public who uh, have something to say about items not listed on the agenda? Okay, I guess um, I had one thing that I'm going to take off my select board hat, which for me is a pair of sunglasses. And uh, I uh, heard today, and I have to verify it, that the electricity rates for this winter are going through the roof, that they might be like three and four times the rates that we're paying, the supply rate. And uh, the rates have not yet been set for Eversource, but uh, it was for another part of Massachusetts and the, um, the uh, I want to say Energy Star, that's not right. Um, the other electric supplier um, published a rate today that was just unbelievably large. I just wanted to let people know if you're watching this or if you're listening there, um, that you, know, you can join the municipal aggregation at any time. Um, if you're not on the municipal aggregation, and you're not otherwise obliged with a different electrical supplier um, joining the municipal aggregation. It's like the lowest rate. It's like 11 and a half cents a kilowatt hour, something like that. Um, it's extremely low cost and uh, it might take a month or two to get into the program, but it's something you can do. And it's there's information, I believe, still on our website about it. Um, it's a matter of making a phone call and getting your account switched over to uh, uh, to one of the two plans we have on the municipal aggregation. 
Um, but boy, it just it just stunned me and my husband when we uh, heard the rate they were quoting that it's going to be their winter rate. So, all right. So uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess there's a pat on the back for the energy committee for getting us through all of that municipal aggregation headache that we went through to get on it. It's really paying off for people to, um, in the town now. Okay, Are any other public comments? Okay, let's move on to scheduled appointments. Um, I've got uh, one scheduled appointment and that would be Keith Bardwell and Susan Barron are gonna give us a summary of the celebrations um, regarding Waitley 250th and they're gonna recommend to us to disband the 250th committee. So uh, I don't know if Keith or Susan is gonna do the talking first or both, but I'd see. I, I will. Come up front and speak up. Okay, I guess I don't know where to read from now. Now where you can sit right there. Oh, thank you. It felt like I was in school and just stand there and recite. First of all, I want to say that the 250th celebration seems to have been a tremendous success. We had a lot of people participating in all of the events. The feedback we were getting was fantastic. Even with the exception of the poker, the weather was great. So from that perspective, I think it was fantastic. From a financial perspective, I don't know if Brian or Andy can share. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Thank you. From a financial perspective, I think it was also a success in that the town had appropriated $60,000 for the celebration, which was done in three $20,000 allotments, uh, of which the, we spent a little under 20000 The other sources of fund, funds were, we got a state grant of about of $10,000, most of which was used for family day. Fundraising yielded us 43000 We sold souvenirs and pottery sales were just under 10000 And then we had in-kind donations. And I'm not an accountant, so I didn't really know where to put the in-kind donations and the in-kind expenses. But... So our, our total expenses of the 100, roughly $128,000 that we had available to us, we spent $84,000, and that includes the 5,000 income. What this means, oh, and let me step back and say, there were two places for money. What I mean by that is basically two bank accounts. The town and state money were in a town account. We also had set up a not-for-profit 501c3 to handle things like fundraising and souvenirs and um, those sorts of things. At the end of the day, I am coming back to, we are coming back to Keith and I, to ask you to take back $40,458.75 into the town coffers. So we spent just under a third of what the town so generously allocated. And I don't feel that we scrimped in any way. We were more successful in fundraising than we might have expected. Um, so please take your money back. Say yes. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you have to buy you have to buy it all. I'll take your money back. Okay. That would end up going to free cash or wherever Dara says it will go. It would go to free cash, yeah. Um, yeah, I think you would take it. That, that was the 40458 40, isn't is currently in the town account. So I think if, if there was to be a uh, motion, it would be to sort of close that account and it would be like a return to free cash. But I think mm -hmm. that's where it came Wouldn't that need a special town meeting vote, Brian? It's, um, it's in the earmarked account. It's been because those 
the first three or two accounts that were created the, um, automatically stayed there. We didn't have to. When we typically have accounts, sort of these special revenue accounts, it uh, left leftovers or amounts remaining are typically closed out at the end of the fiscal year okay. without a town vote. Well, you can let the, basically just let the finance committee know that they have that to work with. Okay, shall we continue or do you all need to do something? Why don't you continue and we'll do whatever voting we need to do at the end. Okay, the 501c3 account has just about $3,300 in it. I will get back to what's going to happen to that money in a minute. Before I do that, though, first of all, I want to thank the committee members, the 250th committee members who did a tremendous amount of work over four years to make all of this happen. And um, it wouldn't have happened without them. We also had tremendous participation from the fire, the police, the, li the library, and the Friends of the Library, the Cultural Council, Paul Newman, and organizing concerts all the way to Watermelon Wednesday, the Book Committee, Historical Society, Church, volunteers, and anybody else I might have forgotten. Highway Department. Highway Department, <laughs> yes. Anybody you can think of that on this one, Pete? Oh, a lot of people <coughs> were able to happen, and we thank all of them. The open pieces of business still are the cake, none of which affect taking back the forty thousand dollars. The cake, which I believe Deerfield is arranging to get sometime in October. Yes. Okay. The panorama. First of all, I go past the library frequently coming and going home. And it amazes me how often I drive by and I always look up the, you know, the driveway and there are people there enjoying the panorama, sitting on the bench. It was a fabulous gift to this community. And our intention was we wanted to give something to um, residents and visitors now, the panorama, and residents of the future of the bench. And I think if what I'm seeing in the way of traffic now is any indication, we succeeded. But the panorama, I'm gonna call it the plaque or the display part of it, not the stand, has a life of three to five years, assuming no vandalism and assuming we don't wanna update the content. So part of that $3,300 would, would we would like to um, have go for maintaining the panorama, updating it. Allison Bell, who designed it, will give us the digital file for it. And I'll get back to who's going to do that in a minute. The another open piece of business is we had always talked about doing a commemorative book, but we don't have anyone to do that. We have between 3,500 and 4,000 photographs from the celebration that are you know, currently on a hard drive. Uh, we met today with Neil at the Historical Society and they have, we're, I'm gonna say in negotiations with them. They would take the photos and work on having a book created. They would take on responsible responsibility for the panorama. They would take ownership of the quilt that was created and have it displayed along with the quilt from 50 years ago, probably in town hall. And they would take ownership of the $3,300 to fund these things. This is not actually something I believe, and I'm looking to Fred because he's our treasurer, so you have to change your hats just like Joyce did. I don't have sunglasses, sorry. Okay. The select board doesn't control that money, the 501c3 does. Right. So you can express opinion, but we don't need to vote on that. Uh, but we'd love to hear if people have opinions on what should happen with any of that. You, you forgot the most important element of the agreement. They're gonna get all the souvenirs out of my living room. They're going to take the leftover t-shirts, the leftover candles, the leftover milk bottles. We can even throw in, I think it's six or seven leftover masks from two years ago. They have somebody who has a barn. And we'll take, we'll have offered to take these things with the understanding 
that any proceeds from selling them will go to the historical society, which I think he, Fred and I are the officers of the 501c3, yeah. and I think we all are thrilled with this arrangement. And happy for them. They can make as much money as they want off of these. I don't know any of that. Um, Keith and I are in the process of compiling, I don't know if archive is the right word, right word but documentation, including a more extensive budget, um, newspaper articles, school, all sorts of papers that will be held for 50 years from now if people want to reference it in planning the next celebration. Keith had a file from 50 years past that was a great help for this. Um, if that file, in my opinion, should go here in the vault, unlike the other stuff that is going to go to the Historical Society, I believe that kind of information would be best stored here. And, and one other point that I'd like to point out, one of the other reasons why I want to, or I feel the Historical Society should be involved with the, with the pictures. Presently, they're on, as Susan mentioned, they're on a hard drive. That's what's current technology. If it goes, that hard drive gets put in the vault here, the likelihood of it being accessible to the technology available in 50 years from now is maybe not likely. Whereas the historical society would be, we feel would be much more likely to keep it updated so that when the next type of technology comes in and that hard drive needs to get updated to that technology, we just don't want, you know, just like for instance, if we had in 1971, a eight track cassette, you know, <laughs> how you're gonna get that kind of stuff. So we need to have technology stuff today. So before I get to our final piece of business, do you have anything to add to? No, I think okay. we've got it covered. At our last meeting of the 250th committee, we took a vote, the town committee took a vote to ask the select board to please disband us. I don't know if that's the right way to phrase it, but We've done our jobs. I don't think there's anything else for the town committee to do. And once we hand everything over to the historical society and Fred closes the bank account and mail box and things like that, there won't be anything for the 501c3 to do. Um, so we come to you ask you to close this down. One, one thing I think you didn't get back to, and that is we're going to propose transferring any remaining money to the historical right. society. Right, they would get the $3,300. From the 501 c 3 to pay for those things that they are going to take on. Right. right, and any, I'm gonna call it new money that comes in, you know, we're selling souvenirs at the um, Historical Society Festival on Sunday, any money from that will come in. There may be an additional donation, there's been talk about somebody else who wanted to support the event. Any money that comes in, and I don't know how we do this legally, but any money that comes in addressed to the 501c3 becomes the Historical Society. Yep. So we ask you to please just stand us. Okay. I think the challenge with this is both Joyce and Fred are on the committee. So. <laughs> well, we. Uh, we did refrain from voting on anything at the last meeting because we knew we would have to vote on it at this meeting. So, uh, and that's on, that's recorded. So we can look that up. Um, so let me ask a, a quick question of Brian. Um, uh, as far as the money being returned to the town, I don't think we need to vote on that. I think that's just a matter of procedure, is it not? Or would you like us to have a vote on it on the record? I believe it's a matter of it's it's a matter of procedure at this point. Okay. So I, I don't think you need to vote on it to return it. <clears throat> okay. And you'll look into whether there really needs to be a vote at town meeting to bring that back to free cash and so on. If that's needed, then that's outside of our um hands anyway. Okay. I'll, I'll follow up with the account. Okay. All right. 
Um, and then uh, the, I guess the other thing they asked us to specifically vote on was to vote them out of business. Um, because we created the committee, we would disband it. Is that the normal procedure? Just by a, by a vote, we uh, we close that committee and we thank them for uh, for all their work. Um, and I guess if they don't exist, we can't thank them. So before we vote to disband perhaps this committee, I just personally want to thank um, boy all the members of the committee. But you know, sometimes leadership is is a really important thing. And I think that's the case here. Um, I think the co-chairs uh, um, did an awesome job of shepherding <laughs> cats, I guess. <laughs> a lot of, uh, I mean, because everybody's very busy and um, and people got a lot done partly because of, uh, of the, the constant work of our leaders. So I want to recognize that before you're disbanded. Yes, thank you. Um, Keith, and oh. I, we, Keith and I have discussed this, and each of us have said we couldn't have asked for a better partner. This was just a perfect meshing of skill sets, and we, we worked beautifully together. We, we never stepped on each other's toes. We each knew what our strengths <laughs> and weaknesses were, and, and they worked together perfectly. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Julie and uh, Fred, do you have anything you want to add before we? Take up a motion. I make a motion for a round of applause for the 250th committee. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I, I will. I will make the motion to disband the town's 250th celebration committee. I'll second it. Okay. The motion was made and seconded. I. I think there's no further discussion. I don't see any hands being raised or people wanting to jump in. Um, then we'll do a roll call vote. Fred? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Julie? Yeah, sounds under duress. And me? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, thank you again. Thank you so much, uh, Keith. Thank you so much, um, uh, everybody. <laughs> everybody, really. Um, I mean, this, great. Really was, this was a lot of people working together and making magic. Yeah. So, yeah. I can now go home and pack up my living room. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, great. Um, okay, where's the agenda? Here we go. Okay, good. Um, the next item is a standing item on the agenda, COVID-19. Um, I don't see anything specific that we need to do with that. I think everybody knows there's a new vaccine out and check with your doctor to go get it. But that, I mean, that's not really our municipal role to vote that people get a vaccine or anything like that. Um, so Brian, is there anything from your side of things that you wanted to say about COVID-19 before we go on? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, great. Then uh, let's go, go on to old business. Um, so we want to discuss the Community Compact Municipal Best Practices Grant Program. And last time we talked about a few different areas and we had some questions. And Hannah maybe has gotten some more information since then. So maybe I will turn it over to Hannah to um, tell us everything that you've learned. Great. Um, so I know last time we had discussed a few different options for this community compact grant program. Um, and I know that one of the options we had brought up was the possibility of using these funds to pave you or like assist in our park grant um, for paving. Um, I don't know whether or not uh, that's an eligible use of the grant funds, but my understanding of this grant is that it's small enough that it wouldn't necessarily cover um, the rest of the funding that we need in order to complete the project as was quoted to us by Terry um, and the folks that Keith reached out to. So um, I think it's up to the select board as to what you decide, but I'm not sure that that I think that these funds could perhaps be used more effectively in other areas of town. Um, 
Unfortunately, I don't have an answer about the farmer's market yet. And I think those were the only two outstanding questions regarding the community compact um, best practice areas. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Um, I know that you had outlined some potential priorities, each of you during the last meeting. Um, I don't know if those are still priorities of yours. I was hoping that we could maybe kind of come to an agreement for the two best practice areas that we could apply for coming up. Okay. So we have to whittle this list down to two. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's a uh, huge list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The one on the screen is a huge list. And there was a smaller list that we, that you had made earlier about things where you thought we needed some help. Well, yes. I, let's open this up. Um, Fred and Julie, what are you thinking? Um, I'll pipe in about the farmer's market. I had spoken very informally to one of the local uh, farm stand folks, and they said that they would not participate in an additional farmer's market because it would just be too much time and money taken away from their current operation. I don't know if other folks feel that way. I That's only one one. Mm. I love the idea, but it may not be something that we're ready to move on yet, I guess. Is what I yeah. Um, one more thing that I forgot to mention. I did ask about the electric vehicle eligibility and if there were any limitations on the funding for electric vehicle eligibility. And I didn't hear any, or they replied to me and didn't outline any specific limitations about electric vehicles. So we could potentially, if we get this grant, use that funding to supplement any other additional funding for electric vehicle charging stations. Oh, okay. I, I looked at the list and the two that I like for an hour, master plan and the electric vehicle, because those are things that we either are going to or should do anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not a, a, doesn't sound like an awful lot of money to start a new project but to supplement any money that we're going to have to put into those things anyway, I, I think is a good idea. I came to the same conclusion looking at the list. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I overlap a bit with what Fred had just said. Um, I think the master plan we need, we, it falls in the category of something we ought to be doing and it is best practice. The um, having served on the personnel committee for I don't know, like five or six years now, we really need professional help going through our employee policies and procedures. Um, and that's something where, you know, we we haven't had much in the way of like explosive trouble there or anything, but um, there's there's a lot of things that are kind of inconsistent in there. And um, we would really benefit from having someone professional help us with that. The people who are on the committee, um, and I'm one of them, you know, bless our hearts, are just not uh, equipped to do that. And, um, but, uh, uh, so those two stuck out. I felt like EV infrastructure, there may be other, um, not maybe, there definitely are other places where we can get funding for that. Um, and this municipal best practices grant, we may not be able to get funding to help hire someone professional to help us go through our, our employee policies and procedures and job descriptions and so on. Um, so I would probably put master plan and human resources uh, policy and procedures uh, a little higher just because I think we could get electric vehicle stuff elsewhere. I'm fine with that too. Yeah, yeah. And Hannah, would you agree that there is funding, potential funding available for electric vehicle infrastructure from other sources? There is. Um, there is a bit of a gap with that funding. So some of the other grants available don't necessarily cover all of the expenses that come with installation of EV charging stations, but they do significantly reduce the total cost of installation. It also sounds like an area where the state may well be ramping up their available contributions as more and more small towns like this want to go in that direction. Yeah, and with the infrastructure bipartisan bill coming out, I think there will also be additional funding. Yeah. 
film. Certainly be amenable to the master plan and the human resources policies and procedures being the two that we go for. Yeah. Um, do we need a, a vote on this? Yes, please. Okay. I move that the master plan and human resources are the two uh, priorities that we go for in the compact communities grant. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. And then uh, let's do a roll call vote. Fred? Yes. Julie? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay. Very good. Um, next item under new business or under old business, excuse me. Um, discuss and vote to award the weatherization work at the Waitley Elementary School to Energy Source. Now, where does that stand? Is that the one where we, we still need a little more information? And have we gotten that information? Yeah, so we are currently working on obtaining a scope of work from Energy Source. I think there's been a little bit of a disconnect between um, what we were hoping for in the form of a scope of work and what Energy Source provided. Um, so we're looking for some more detail from them. Um, Brian, please feel free to jump in if I'm missing anything. But um, we've been in conversation with them today, especially talking about that. And we're hoping that they will get back to us soon with a more detailed scope of work before we sign any contracts with them. Yeah, Hannah said a little bit more diplomatically than I would have, but <laughs> um, I, I regret putting this item on the agenda because we're totally not ready. So okay. um, it was a disappointing response that, that we received from them. So um, if we could table that, I think that would be good. Okay, all right, let's consider it tabled then. Um, I think uh, given that the library folks are waiting there so patiently, I didn't realize that their stuff was until the second page. Um, so there's um, the library has a request under new business where we're going to discuss and consider some requests for CLFRF money, which is COVID something something relief funds money. Um, virus the local fiscal recovery funds. Okay. Um, then uh, uh, the, they want to talk about a library accessibility um, project that I think we know about the project, but there's some unplanned expenses that came up. So um, why don't we go to new business A and uh, let the library folks have a chance to chat and then maybe they can get home for dinner and, and whatever else they need to do. Um, so why don't we go right ahead there? Go ahead. Um, I think I see Jim and... Clinger. Bob, okay. Um, I'd say just speak up and uh, and let us know what you're asking for. Sure. Well, thank you for moving us forward. Uh, thank you for seeing us. Robert Klinger, I'm one of the, I'm a new trustee as of last year, so I guess I'm not that new. Um, Bob Smith. So Jim and I were clerk of the works for the Lyft Accessibility a project that we are just wrapping up or have just wrapped up at the library. Um, it, hopefully everybody's had a chance to see it and take a ride. Um, we think it came out well. Uh, we have about $726 left over in the budget. As we were wrapping everything up, we still have issues. So we're moving incrementally with the building to get it up to ADA certification. This was a big step. We still have issues as you come in, the North stack room is not ADA accessible. So that's as you come in and go past the circulation desk on your left. Um, we know that we worked very hard with the building inspector locally, but the architect as part of their job needs to file a variance with the state because the building itself is not ADA compliant. So we thought that being able to work through with the building inspector would alleviate that. Turns out that wasn't the case. We would have appreciated a little more heads up from the architect, but they had to file. Um, we, we missed it. We didn't anticipate it. We were hoping to get around it. Maybe that's the wrong way to say it, but we were hoping to not have to take that extra step. Um, 
the costs were help me out, Jim. You're better with the actual numbers. What the two invoices, Brian, you can help us. There's about forty two hundred dollars. The two remaining invoices are forty two hundred dollars. If we apply the remaining 726 pounds from the lift project, that brings it down to do you have that number, Brian? Two thousand something. Yeah. And so we we are here. Um Bob Smith. The chair of the library trustees and I met with Brian a few weeks ago. Uh, he put us on the agenda for this evening. Uh, there was a suggestion to use these funds. And so that's why we're here is to talk to you all about it. And Okay. Um, the, the extra dollars would go towards, um, is would it basically be a, a plan uh, so that later you could go out to bid and get some work done is that can you like tell me a little bit more about what the funds are specifically for because i know there's a there's a process right um i'll just jump in here for a minute um at the outset uh during the feasibility study the architect told us that she would need to file a variance on that that piece uh-huh as the project progressed we were a couple of months into it she informed us that the state was extremely reluctant to grant variances such as this. Oh. And her, her best advice is that it's just not going to happen. And we can pay her and her assistant to travel to Boston a couple of times to present it, wait six months for an answer, and the answer probably would be no. So okay. having had that information, we took it upon ourselves to find another solution. Okay. At that point, we carefully measured everything. We measured radiuses, we measured aisle widths, and um, came up with the idea that maybe we could section these, these stacks and move them a little bit. They're all bolted to the floor, mm -hmm. and we would gain that, that area for a wheelchair to make mm -hmm. the runs. Oh, okay. Oh, so this is for the for the actual work to get done, not for like the plan to, and so on. This is to actually go in there and do something that right. should be ADA compliant. Okay. One of, one of our trustees uh, did a detailed analysis that had we done that, we would have had to give up about half of our collection, mm -hmm. which defeats the purpose of a library. <laughs> yeah. So I then went to the State Mass Library Association and asked them for some assistance on Sheldon because they're the experts on it. And the young lady came and looked at it and she said, these, these stacks are called earthquake stacks, earthquake. There were just two little minor earthquakes, by the way, this past weekend, one in Greenwich and one down in Northern New Jersey. But that's how they're built. They're all well up together. They're tied at the top and they're designed not to fail during a an earthquake. Not that we get a lot of them, but nevertheless, that's what we had. So it was it was a no-win situation. We take the stacks off, put new ones in, in order to make the, the radiuses work, we would lose half the collection. We looked at perhaps getting a mobile unit, putting it out into the into the foyer, and that was like the 12 feet long, and that still would have made a significant decrease in the size of the so the, the trustees voted at that point, let's put this issue aside and let's get the, the lift done. That was the, that was the big deal. And we'll look at it after the fact. And we had a certificate of occupancy. The building inspector did what he was supposed to do. And we got this big surprise in the mail of her fee for filing for this variance, which really she had to do. It's part of her business. Um, but there is no good solution. There really is not. And we have a, a full-time individual at that entryway to that room to assist anybody who would request a, a book. We also have the books listed on a computer. So that was our that was our argument. Yes, they can't put a wheelchair in there, but they can still get what they need with assistance from our from the uh, individual at the circulation desk. So there's where we, we never anticipated this. I did not know she filed it. None of us did. Got, got biased. But 
that's what we're here to ask that the town release the monies to pay this bill. We've uh, we've already oh. we've already expended about eighty two hundred and fifty dollars on this project out of our out of our endowments. Yeah. yeah. Eighty two thousand of, of monies that we've expended. And um, so we're mm. just looking for a little bit of help here. Mm. Can I ask a question? Yes. Is there any outcome on the variance yet? She filed it. Has there been a response from the state? She never filed. She's asking for money. She's asking for money for filing it, but she never filed it. That's correct, because it would have gone, in her opinion, nowhere, and it would have cost us money to take it any further. It sounds like it's costing us money to not take it further. I, I, I really don't understand this, where somebody says, we don't need to file a variance because it's going to get turned down, and so she doesn't file a variance, but she sends us a bill for her fee for filing a variance, and if she didn't file it, I don't think we have to pay the bill. I mean, is there some place where I'm wrong along there? Sure, she had to file. There was no question whether we said not to or not. She had to do it. It's part of her her license to be Okay, to. but I thought you also just said that she didn't file it. No, no, she did not. I think it was just put set aside because she knew that it would all come out negative anyway. Okay, so I'm getting I'm getting mixed signals here, Jim. On the one hand, you're saying she did not file it because we knew the outcome was not going to work. But then you say she had to file it. And then she did, and she sent us a bill for it. So do you see where I'm confused? I think what she did, Joyce, is she read it. I think it was, she didn't file. She prepared the document to file. And I think that's what the bill is for. How much more does it cost to actually file to uh, file the variant. Uh, Julie, I don't know that question, but I'm assuming there's probably more fees involved in the state. Okay. So we, we are see. requesting, since since this document has been created, um, we're requesting a copy of it. If, before we submit any payment, then th we need to get a copy of this document. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 That, that was my so, understanding. So you're what saying said. they did everything up to the point of filing and didn't file it. She knew. She knew that we would never get it. Well, she then I don't it. understand if she's advising that you don't file this, then why did she do all the preparation for filing it and at the same time telling you that that's useless? Why on earth is and this seems like a colossal waste? Or maybe colossal is too big a word, but um, this doesn't sound like it sounds like like I I need the fees, so I'm going to send you a bill for it. And and was the prep work this prep work done before or after you had told her that you weren't going to file? Was this prep work done after you said no? We're you know yeah, we're not so going to get it, therefore we're not going to file. Our our part wasn't. We're trying to find a solution. No, I no, I know, but I'm trying to get a timeline here of when this preparation work was done. Was it done at some point where the architect knew that it was never going to be filed? I, I can't answer that, Fred. All I know is we did meet with her, and she said, "I can file it, but it's not going to go anywhere." And I assume from that point that. She would probably have to go through the motions of preparing to file it and submit that. Hmm. Um, Do you think that, I mean, this is a reputable firm. Well, I, I, know, I know that. Uh, do you think that they would be willing, for the sake of uh, those of us on the select board who aren't completely clear about what's happening, to, to put something in writing that clarifies what they did yeah. and what? remains to be done if it is going to be filed and what they're actually asking for the fee for so that we can because I think we're we're a little bit back and forth here we're not sure right yeah, yeah. I'm just confused about why we or the library should be paying for 
preparation for a presentation, which the person doing the preparation knew was never going to be filed. Or was advising, you know, on the one hand was preparing, on the other hand was advising, don't file this. I have no problem eventually moving forward with discussing releasing money, but I think we'd like to understand a little bit more about the process. Does that make sense? Do you have a. Yeah, whether, you know, a written statement is to, you know, what happened and when, or having some Jones would said come in and answer our questions. That, that seems like a reasonable request. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. You have to see out. Yes. I think at this point that probably the contractor has it in his possession. I have not seen it, but I know it's been issued. Did he issue the CO even in the absence of the, the non conformity with the stacks? Okay. I think we need to, yeah, I think we do a little bit of research. Yeah. Because, yeah, usually okay. the contract gets a copy of the CO. Well, yeah, it's, it's, that is Brian's question is why did he issue it if it was still, if the building still have compliance with ADA? Why did he issue it? Right. Well, I think that he issued it based on the construction of the lift and the fire alarm system and all of the other things that we did in the handicapped bathrooms. Mm -hmm. And that was that was his focus. And we passed that test. And I brought him in three times during the construction process to ask him if there was anything that he felt was going to be a problem. And each time he said, no, you guys are doing a good job. It's... And we never talked about the stacks. <laughs> yeah. Although he knew. Right. And I, I, I think we need either yeah. writing or the person to hear from John Woodson to, to know what's going on. Yeah. Okay. All right. It sounds like we've got a consensus here. Um, but yeah, um, thank you um, for coming in and thank you for working so hard to make our library ADA compliant. Thank you. Okay. okay. All right. So this will probably continue on to uh, another meeting after we've had a chance to get a little more information. Okay. Um, <laughs> great. Something else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the notes on the stop sign. Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so at this point, um, is there anybody else there that's waiting for a particular part of the agenda? I'm not seeing uh anything. So I may go back to old business and then come back to the other CLFRF uh, requests um, you know, when we get back to new business. Okay. So I'm going back to old business uh, part C now uh, to uh, discuss and perhaps vote to award the office bill dot work at town offices to union office interiors. So I, I think I give that to Brian or Brian yep. probably. Yeah. So at a previous meeting, the board had authorized um, us to go out to bid to try to get um, the office panels that we were looking for uh, to separate the space behind the, the town court treasurer collector's office. Uh -huh. uh, included in the packet is the response that we received from uh, union office interiors. They had also met with us earlier um and we're looking at the space with us um so we put it out the bid and they were the sole ones that um submitted a bid uh total price is thirty three thousand nine hundred fifty eight dollars um and again that's to separate that office um into that office space into three um i guess we'll call them semi-private offices right because they're not going to go up to the ceiling um, but it'll provide some semi-privacy for um, 
you know, we'll, we'll, be, able to, we'll be able to spread out a little bit more um, and move some folks around and hopefully get some space for uh, some, some working space for some of the boards and committees that, that really haven't had any, at least since, at least since we've moved here, the town's moved here. So um, yeah. it also, it, it also helps us spread out a little bit as we're hopefully, well, I don't know what end of COVID looks like, but we're, you know, we're able to, we're, we're able to spread out more, um, yeah. which I think is a positive thing. So um, yeah. still need to do some uh, miscellaneous electrical work. Uh, the way that the lights are set right now in that back space, it wouldn't correspond to where the, the uh, you know, the dividers are going to be. Um, and then we'll have to, so I think that's the main thing right now. Someone would have to walk all the way back to the building to turn on some lights towards the front. Um, when that space was separated, we just didn't, we didn't need to address the electrical issues then because it was just empty storage space at that point. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's too bad there's not more than one bid to compare to. <laughs> um, is this price something? Is this about when you had anticipated? Higher yeah, dollars? we did. We did earlier have a quote. It might have been a year or two ago when we were trying to sort of figure out what we were wanting to do uh, from a, a different company. It was it was around that. Mm -hmm. Well, do, do storage plans, I see chairs and things and tables that are there currently. Do you have a storage plan for where those things are going? Hopefully the tables are leaving. Um, that's one of the surplus items that we that we have listed. Um, oh, okay. It's a, it, it seems to be stuff occupying the space now. So mm -hmm. Yeah. Got to go somewhere. Yeah. It, yep. And not... not so some of that is on the surplus uh, property up list. In the new hall, right, of course. Yeah, there's some space on the other side of the wall that okay. That we don't use. Okay. All right. So I would entertain a motion then on this. I mean, uh, I mean well, discuss and consider requests. I guess maybe a procedural question is do we just vote to grant or not grant these? Um, sorry. Uh, Sorry. Uh, no, this is not the CL. I was getting confused with CL up or up. So at this point, we are awarding a bid that has come in. Okay. Yeah, so I guess the, the the motion would be to award or not award the build out work to. Yeah, uh, to but what would be funding source? Um, so there's approximately. 80 something thousand dollars um, from in town meeting appropriation from many years ago. Um, that it was it was an appropriation made when this building was originally obtained by the town. Um, and we've been slowly spending those um, dollars down really as we've needed to over the years. Um, some with the um, to separate the that was mm -hmm. one large warehouse space back there. We've been building some walls. Um, and I think some uh, portion of it was also used for the uh, the wall back there. Um, but that's oh. about how much. Okay, so roughly that amount. Yeah. Okay. okay, so there won't be, this isn't CLFRF money this, or no. Yeah. Or town meeting appropriation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and move we approve the uh or accept the bid for work on town offices from union office interiors i second okay great any further discussion okay let's go to a roll call vote fred yes julie yes. joyce yes okay great um uh, next item under old business is to discuss a draft letter from the select board to the Building inspector regarding residence letters expressing concerns about 148 State Road and the lot immediately to the north. Um, and I'm looking in the packet now. I read over that letter quickly earlier today, but I want to uh, take another quick look at it. You want me to share the screen? Um, sure.
Okay. So that first part, I take that as basically summarizing the situation. Um, yep. And then uh, kind of acknowledging what things have gone on where people are trying to get information for planning board and and so on. So kind of a, a summary of the state of things. Um, and then uh, the second paragraph, I sort of interpret as, hey, I know they didn't write you this letter, but we're writing you this letter um, because we see it as part of our job to do that. Um, and then we uh, ask him for a reply and give him a due date for his homework. That's what it looks like to me. Is, that, is, there, is there anything important in there that I missed in that kind of short summary? I don't think so. I, I have a question about the last sentence in the first paragraph. The planning board sent you a letter via email on September 6th. 2022 is that the letter that was shared with us by who shared a letter with with the select board with the planning board to put together um i think it came from uh, the planning board's email from the planning board okay. the planning board email do we have that available grant for do we have a, that available to pull up and look at give me a second i can pull it up yeah This is Brandt from the planning board in this moment. Do I, can I make one quick comment? Um, sure, Grant, go ahead. Hi there. Um, we were earlier this evening, the planning board did meet and we did talk about this situation a bit. And I'll just share that several of us believe that ground has been broken at the parcel 12-0-24-2, which is subject of the letter being shared now that we sent to the building inspector. So we believe we have no confirmation of this, that the building inspector did indeed issue a building permit for the barn expansion. Hmm. Would it be something we should do to add on at the end of the first paragraph to make a note that town meeting specifically declined to change the zoning of that property. So it's not, the, the zone where the barn is, is not in a commercial zone. And specifically town meeting did not want it to be. Just as, as a notice to the building inspector that the two properties have to be at least looked at in a different light given a different zone. You want to add a sentence at the end of the first paragraph? Yeah, I, I would think, uh, yeah, because these sentences are uh, taking note of the fact that the town meeting has specifically declined to. Yeah. Zone that parcel with you know, north of 148 State Road. Or which is declined to yeah. be commercial or to keep its residential agricultural zone. Yeah. That sounds like relevant information. 
And I just it think was it's under the impression that it was a relevant going to be reminder more. to the building inspector that it's not. Uh, yeah. That, that that property shouldn't be just absorbed into the same use as the other one. Yeah. Sounds like a good idea. Yeah. I asked for clarification about the last sentence because uh, I think I might have, I might be understanding the letter from the planning board differently. Uh, I'm not seeing them necessarily expressing concern about how the proposed addition would lead to the expansion and seeing the planning board saying they have no concerns as long as one, two, and three are adhered to, which is perhaps a little way, a little gentler way of saying and that they have concerns. I just I wanted to see the original letter because it wasn't that's not exactly how it So I guess what I'm saying is I would just say the select board is aware that you requested feedback from the planning board about the issue and that the planning board sent you a letter via email on September 6, 2002, period. And not synopsize it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that, that, that could work. I, I, I guess I am. Yeah. I can't see who's on that. I think Brand's still on, maybe. Yeah, Brand's um, still there. I mean, I sort of read it as the planning board has no no concerns except the following. Uh huh. But yeah, yeah, yeah I see how it's worded, right? The planning board has no concerns to the building permit. And we're supposed to then they the request three things. The yeah. following are sort of the, the concerns, right? Right. Mm -hmm. We have no concerns, but these are. Yeah. Well, I guess, in a way, if we really want to point out that these three things are concerns, can we put in that sentence, I'm still trying, I'm working with my, the various windows here. Um, the planning board sent you a letter via email on September 6, 2022, expressing three concerns about wow. how they proposed. So to point out that there were, we interpret this letter as those are three things that, we're, that they are concerned about. That clarifies it. Would you be open to that, Brian? As the yeah, I mean, probable author of this letter. <laughs> I'm not signing the letter, so it's yeah, uh, right. whatever you want. Sorry, I micro edit your letter. <laughs> In right. Public yeah. Like I said. I'm not signing on the bottom, so. Right, no, I mean, I, and I think Julie's point is well taken because the phrase no concerns appears in the first part of that letter from the planning board. Um, and we're saying it expresses concern. So uh, we we it's on us to probably say how we're interpreting that letter as expressing concerns. Yeah, you know, even though it has the word no concerns there, it's the other three things that are the concerns. And since they so nicely enumerated them, well, it's easy to refer to them as the three things they have, are concerned about. How about, if, I'm sorry. If I could just add, I, I think, so I think there's a, I think there's a, there's, it, it's nuanced, right? Right. Um, and it's sort of down in the weeds zoning stuff, but so, so they have no concerns with the issuance of the building permit, which really essentially means that what they're proposing to build and what they're proposing to use it as, mm. um, they have no issues with that. But there's these extraneous things yes. that might be going on that they're concerned that. Yeah, that, concerned that, it, yeah. Um, that, that yes. this property might slide away from the established views as the adjacent property has, yeah. apparently. Yeah, right. Or at least according to the complaint. And I propose a <laughs> final sentence for that. 
Sure. The select, the select board is aware that you requested feedback from the planning board about the issue, comma, and that the planning board sent you sent to you a letter via email on September 6, 2022, expressing three concerns about whether the proposed or how the proposed addition to the existing barn, et cetera, et cetera, remainder of the sentence as is. Yeah. And then followed by a note about town meeting. Town meeting, yes. As has, has considered this issue. Yeah, although the town meeting just considered whether yeah. it could be rezoned commercial. I, I and, consider. But, yeah. Right, that has to go in though. It was specifically considered and not uh, acted upon. Right. Okay. Looks like a good draft with the minor addition. See it at our next meeting, and I guess then you'll have to change the date on the in the last paragraph. Well. No, I, I um. I think we we can go ahead with this letter with the minor revisions, right? You want to go as amended, then I'll just okay. That's that. Oh yeah. Okay. That's okay. Fine. I move to accept as amended this letter. Second. Okay. Great. Um, seeing no further indication of discussion, uh, we'll go to a roll call vote. Fred. Yes. Julie. Yes. Joyce. Yes. Okay. Great. All right, uh, there's the agenda. Um, now back to new business. Um, we did look at the library uh, accessibility and we're gonna wait for more information on that. So um, on this discuss and consider, I guess um, my question for Brian is, are we at a point where you might be expecting us to vote on the these things or is this just a, let's hear about these and think about them and discuss them later, because I know we have a CLFRF committee as well. Yeah, so that's sort of what, what I've, let's talk about that part first. Okay. Um, and I'll, 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 a brief recap of, of the history of, of ARPA and CLFRF. Um, when it was originally um, adopted, by Congress, Treasury, U.S. Treasury was given the task of, you know, adopting a rule, a preliminary rule, and, and a final rule as to how the, the funds were to be spent. Um, and the, the preliminary rule came out, and it identified five eligible uses for the money, um, public health, economic impacts of the pandemic, lost public sector revenue, premium pay, and water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. And that's one I think that we had talked about in the past. Um, and uh, at least my thinking at the time was we should have a, a, a committee to help um, identify projects for these different um, categories. And then uh, the final rule came out from the US Treasury and it pretty much, it, it is said that if you have an amount, if you're a local, unit of the government and you have an amount less than $10 million, you can elect to take it all as lost revenue. Um, and what that means is if, is if you elect to take it as um, all as lost revenue, um, there's really no restrictions um, on what you can spend the money on as long as it's a legitimate municipal purpose. So it really expanded our eligible use of the money. Um, yeah. And the Fred's on the committee and, and on the CLFRF committee. And we had, I think, four or five meetings and um, we had some, some project ideas and we, we tried to solicit for projects and um, we didn't make much headway, but we had a list. Um, and then there were conversations within the committee um, as we got closer to town meeting. Um, and funding sort of capital projects. Uh, one of the some of the, a part of the discussion of the committee was how do we how do how does the committee um, 
you know, how do they maximize the these funds to everybody in the town? Um, so part of the discussion was if we can fund the capital items, it's money that we would otherwise use with with taxpayer dollars or um, or free cash, which is really uh -huh. you know uh, previous year's um, revenue. Yeah. Um, you know, that would be one way to sort of spread it around. Um, they could we could use the CLF money for those uh, for those expenses. Um, it would save you know free cash, and I think this past year um, the town voted to essentially reduce the uh, tax levy by an additional fifty thousand um, dollars. So that helps all taxpayers, and then some of that money was also put into stabilization accounts. Um, and then so that's sort of where we left. The committee hasn't met. Um, really since that time because um, we didn't have any requests that came across. Um, so fast forward, I have, you know, I've received these three or four different, uh, three or four requests. Um, and some of them are, well, like we just talked about the library one. Um, you know, it's a request for additional funds of a project that already exists. Um, and it's, uh, it's unfortunately, Really, I think it's an obligation that's already been incurred. Um, so, you know, an, an expense like that, it's really the, the question is really not not whether we pay it. Well, until I heard uh, some information tonight, but um, you know, where do we get the money from? Um, so there's these these the small amounts that that come up, and really, our, our choices are CLF or F money. But if that does didn't exist, this would be a special town meeting more article, most likely. And we would be looking to access um, what, if free cash was certified, free cash or stabilization accounts um, to pay those costs. Um, so it, it got me to thinking, and, and Fred and I had an email exchange, um, sort of what's the best, what's the best sort of approval pathway for these different types of items that are coming in that are seeking to you know, spent the CLFRF monies. Um, you know, we've had in the past we've had requests for additional money because the you know the quotes for the for the the town hall door opener project were, were higher. Um, but just wanted to sort of talk about sort of the pathway of how we steer these through. If, if I can give a little background on the CLFRF committee, it was set up to with members from the water department, from Board of Health, uh, from the housing committee, largely to try to find out, were there any large projects that we'd want to spend money on out of this large sum of money? And ultimately we came up with nothing that was a new large project that otherwise wouldn't get funded or if it, that we could apply this money towards. There was a meeting after, I guess, the Finance Committee met in the spring, I don't know if it was at the town meeting or not, where there was sort of general nodding approval of using, having used it for the annual capital projects. Um, the select board you know, approved the spending, but the Finance Committee was, a, was sort of assuming that approval. But the CLR, CLRF committee really, if there aren't any major single projects that this money is going to be applied to, then it really becomes a duplication with the capital projects committee. If this money is, as it was this year, going to be used for those projects. That it, you know, I sit on the committee, the ICE committee. But it really, at this point, if that money is for this year and next, while it's still available at the end of 2024, <clears throat> SMS um, is going to use that money for capital projects, then it's just duplicating efforts with the capital yeah. project. Okay. okay, so they will not feel like we're stepping on their toes if we were to decide to support funding the things that we haven't discussed yet um, and uh, 
right? That's yeah. what, so as a proceed as a procedural thing, we're not doing an end run around them, right? That's kind of what I'm hearing. The, the final, yeah, the final authority for expenditures of CLF RF funds are the are the select board. Um, okay. Uh, and I had in, in my my thinking had been. Um, that you know I, I could see if it was if it was new projects um, that that maybe we would want to send them to either the capital improvement planning committee or the, the CLFRF before the before the, the select board would, would want to take a vote. Um, that's obviously whatever the board wants to do. Um, but it just seemed it just seemed um, duplicative to me and you know, if if there was a pro an existing project that's been approved by the select board or town meeting that comes back and hey, we need you know, and I go back to the town council we're opening a project, we need you know, I don't know how much it was, six thousand more dollars for the, for the project. It would seem just unnecessary to go back to the CLFRF committee yeah. to have a meeting and then have them recommend or not recommend, um, you know, the additional money. So yeah, and and, and if, I, if there was. Again, a single project. That's just for the sake of example. I'm not pushing either of these. Uh, Tri Town V for the senior center that we wanted to put a quarter of a million dollars into. Then I would say go back to CLRF committee and see is this where we should do spend the money or should we be trying to you know apply it to the individual capital project and get the opinions there. But at this point, we don't have that single big project that we're looking to apply this money to. Okay. So that, yeah, that's and it, it's sort of, in a way, it's a matter of these are smaller items. And um, for capital things, they were working, they really think maybe our capital committee is really the place to go for that. So, okay, good. No, I just want to make sure that, well, partly I don't want to step on somebody else's toes. And if we, and I sort of wanted to hear back what happened to CLFRF committee. So, and okay. also the CLR, CLFRF committee is strictly advisory. They've got yeah. no <laughs> authority. To... Oh, no, I understand. But I would want their advice if that was the necessary thing. Yeah. Okay. So, um, who has more information about the MVP grant match? Would that be Hannah or would that be Brian? Uh, I think it can be either of us. So um, right now we're requesting $24,000 as a match to the MVP grant. Um, you can see in the associated materials, um, Brian, if you'd be willing to share your screen to show the budget. Um, we're re uh, requesting the 24 is a rounded number. It leaves a little bit of wiggle room. Um, I think about $800 or so, just in case we need a little bit more funding. Um, but that was the amount that we had budgeted for in our application to MVP. Um, and that comprises the 10% match that MVP requires as part of the grant program. Okay. Um, this is the beautiful color. There we go. Now it's up on the other screen too. Um, it's really low quality. <laughs> right. So the, the town is required to come up with Thirty-four thousand dollars, roughly, of its own funds as a match. Yeah. Not even. Um, yeah, I mean, we're not totally cash match, so part of that is the ten thousand dollars. Including the in kind. Yes. Yeah. Thirty-four thousand, roughly, worth of value, cash or in kind. Correct. Yeah, and this um, it can, this expands the the um, array to be. Uh, bigger than we had originally asked for. Is that correct? This is for the original array um, that so we voted for from Valley Solar. Um, 
if we would like to, I mean, I think that that goes back to the question of our priority with um, the direction we wanna take the MVP project, whether or not we wanna maximize the energy output or the solar array size on the rooftop. Um, we have a meeting, this is gonna come up later in the town administrator updates, but we have a meeting coming up with the energy committee. We finalized a time. Mm. Um, so okay. I was we could discuss it then. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Because I was in on that other energy committee meeting where we were thinking about those priorities as well. So, but this doesn't include anything that they had discussed at that previous meeting. And I know there's another meeting coming up. Right. Yeah. This okay. is just yeah. the original grant application. Oh, okay. No, one point you talked about the uh, one of the, I guess, the contractor fee for the for something coming out of the contingency fund, but it sounds like we have to put in the money anyway as part of the match. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the first at, half of at that. At one point you would thought that there's a $33,000 contingency in the grant, and you thought that we might be able to apply that to the uh, to one of the, the fees that the, I guess the contractor be if I can read it off here. Yeah, or the, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Or, or a hookup fee with that resource or something like that. Is that still, I, I is there still a hookup fee in addition to this? Yes, yeah, so we still need to do the transfer upgrade. Um, I believe that's on the lower right hand side of the page. Um, and that's what we were hoping to use the contingency for. Okay. That's just, that just should say potential transformer upgrade. Not transformer. I was wondering Not transformer. 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 Yeah. Okay, so that's where the contingency. Okay. Fine. That's where we might have to spend some of that money. And, and the match is a is a is it what what percent is it? Is it 15? 10 percent. We're lucky that in that it's a 10 percent. Usually I think it's um yeah, I think it's 15 or 20 otherwise. Okay. Okay. All right. And um, um, to, approving this now does not prevent us from expanding the project later, oh, I mean, obviously <laughs> on, on a short timeline, like the Energy Committee is considering recommending, but we're still in the information gathering process for that. Um, but this has to happen anyway, right? Yeah. I, okay. I believe so, yeah. The match amount would, would not change whether whether the select board wanted to put additional seal frf money towards in the array larger i think is right yeah yeah it's, either it's, larger array or larger batteries or both to take advantage of some of the other financial incentives that go along with those yeah okay all right uh julie and fred do you have any other Questions or comments on this? No. Okay. Then on this, I believe we you would want us to take a vote, right? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. So we're Brian. We're looking to approve use of twenty two thousand three hundred ninety one dollars of our vote number, correct? What the motion? I, I rounded up, but yeah, you. <laughs> okay, then I will move that. We use or draw from the ARPA account $22,391 for the town office's energy project. I'll second that. Okay. Um, seeing nobody who wants to further discuss it, um, I'll go to a roll call vote. Fred? Yes. Julie? Joyce? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, treasure collector software, some add-on software for the treasure collector. Is there anybody there who can say a few words about that? Actually, can I, can I interrupt for one second, Joyce? Sure. I think the amount needs to be the 23066. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Because there's a little bit of that match needs to, is for public engagement and that's yeah. just the match for the- Okay, I'm not sorry, I, I looked at the number down below. 
Oh, yeah, yeah I see that. The, so there's the 2366 number. I, I'm, I'm sorry, then I'll amend my motion to make it for $23,066 rather than $22,391. And I'll second that amended motion. Okay. Uh, roll call vote then. Fred? Yes. Julie? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Very good. Now, our treasure collector add on software, the stuff that's going to make them so efficient, right? Or help us in some other way. Brian, um, who has information about that? Is that Brian or Amy, maybe? Um, I do. Um, so you'll recall that we switched the treasure collector switched from uh, what, what we call the point software system to VADAR. Um, and it's actually one of our CLFRF funded projects. Um, when they did that, um, they learned that the existing software that the water department uses is not, doesn't talk with VADAR, essentially. Mm -hmm. The version that, that the water department has doesn't talk to VADAR. Um, so um, we need to upgrade, um, you know, billing software mm. uh, that the treasurer collector uses um, to send out the water bills so that it integrates with VADAR is essentially what it breaks down to. Okay. Um, What's the, the uh, rough cost of that? There's, I'm sorry, I should, that's probably in the in the file I've got right here on my desk. It just, it just wasn't clear what that was related to. Yeah. It's the the sixteen thousand. The sixteen thousand nine hundred. Okay, and they crossed out the ninety five cents per cellular endpoint per month. That's now yeah. free. My understanding is that doesn't apply. Okay. 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 Wow, software is <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, think. it does look like there's some hardware yeah, there. Specialized software is very expensive. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, I buy specialized software for graphic design. Like, right. Bigger, but there's also a, like a, a handheld device or a tablet device there. Is that the one so they can just like drive by your house and do your meter reading? Because I know that saves actually a lot of time. Yeah. But, yeah. I ask a question. Mm, sure, Keith. Why doesn't this come out of the enterprise fund? Um, that's that's, that's a legitimate question. Um, I think part of uh, part of the discussion that was that was had was, I mean, it's sort of a causation, right? But for the, the switch to VADAR, then the water department software still works and there's, there's billing. Um, so it's the only way to come out. But uh, on the other hand, I, I can see Keith's point as well. So, yeah. Can you remind your newest board member what the enterprise fund is? Sure. Um, so departments that are operated through an enterprise fund are financially separate from the town. Well, they have their, so all the revenue generated by the water department goes into a separate fund mm -hmm. and all their expenses are paid out of that fund. So the idea is that they're financially self-sufficient. Okay. Um, and so, so, so key point would be that, you know, it's a water department expense mm -hmm. um, and that it should come out of those out of that at that point. Then the you know the other argument is you know something that happened because of the change that the town made. So those are two things to balance, I guess. Ultimately who which department for treasurer or water is getting greater benefit or should we split the cost between them? I mean when does the billing? Yeah. Um, so it would be additional work for the treasure collector. 
um, but splitting could be a poss possibility. Um, but it, it sounds like the water department by getting their billing done more efficiently is benefiting as well. Whether or not they wanted it, they will. Yeah, it sounds like they will be getting a benefit. From this. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. There's absolutely there's absolutely a benefit to the to the water department as well. Yeah. I mean, it's updated software, right? I mean, right. presumably the whatever software is being used now is well. It's you not can already right. see it's already not talk. It's already not integrated with with updated software. So, no. it'll be a cost that they eventually have to incur. Sure. Yeah. No. I would think that we should split the cost the the cost between the enterprise fund and yeah Fred for would that cause um like I presumably that would cause some delay, but do you think that's going to be a significant delay? If it's delayed a month or two, that's probably not too big a deal, right? But um, if the water department can't come up with the roughly eight thousand five hundred dollars. I don't really know how much slack they have in their budget and what they have in reserve. Yeah, I believe there's a temporary workaround. Um, hmm. Oh, okay. And that could so, be done. It's not, I don't think it's something that we would want to treasure clerk to keep doing. I think it requires separate spreadsheets and stuff like that. And um, yeah. so I, I've also had a problem all along using CLFRF money for the water department. Not that the water department isn't valuable and important, mm -hmm. but it doesn't benefit the whole town. It right. benefits the people who are on the water department's lawn. Mm. Yep. And that the CLFR, CLFRF money should be things that essentially benefit everyone in the town or potentially benefit everyone in the town. Yeah, yes, it's, yeah. They, they they mentioned water infrastructure as a thing that they were trying to direct money to, but if we do that in our town, it's somewhere between I don't know half and two thirds of the people are are on that system, and another one third to one half are not. So, yeah, that's a good point. Well, can we look into splitting that half and half? Okay, so I can expect this to come back on another <coughs> agenda in the future. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the um, last item there is a map and planning inventory and filing system, which I'm pulling up here. I see that we've got an estimate of a budget. I don't see a definition of anywhere of exactly what it is we're asking the system to do, Brian. I, I think in, in conversations that I had with, with Amy in the past couple of days, um, I think I think I think she would like to refine the budget. Um, yeah, I, I I don't doubt that it would be useful and needed, yeah. but I don't know what we're what we would be approving. Yeah. Right, I, I think this was sort of, for lack of a better term, a desktop budget. Okay. Um, I think that I think Amy's plan, I think, is to have somebody out to. Okay. But essentially, what what is the problem, and what is? Yeah, the and why is this the solution? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. This one's not. This one is not time sensitive. It would just happen to come in while we were having this. Um, okay. All right. It sounds like it needs to be fleshed out a little bit. Yeah. All right. Great. Uh, we have um, three appointments are the next three items. Um, I see uh, Ruth Fairman is uh, 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 um, recommended for the Whitley Cultural Council. I move we appoint Ruth Perriman to the Whitley Cultural Council. Okay. I can, uh, well, I'll just say that I would love to know more about Ruth Fairman. I don't know who she is. <laughs> I have no doubt that if she volunteered, she <laughs> would be a good member of the Cultural Council, but uh, so I'll second. L that. Long time town resident. Okay. 
I yeah. Second. Okay. All right. Um, all those, all those in favor, then. <laughs> yeah. All right. Then um, we'll do a roll call. Then uh, all those in favor, for, uh, Fred. Yes. Julie. Yes. Uh, Joyce. Yes. Okay. The next is um, an appointment of Chris Williams to the Recreation Co Committee's coordinator position. This is the paid position. Yeah. The administrative paid position for someone doing the scheduling and the, you know, that that kind of work. And Chris is the chair of the Recreation Department currently. Yes. So. Yep, any motion should be subject to contingent on right. a re a resolution from the Recreation Commission. Yeah. I for the job description. Okay. I'll move that we appoint Chris Williams to the Recreation Coordinator position contingent upon his resignation uh, from the Recreation Second. Council, Commission. Commission. Thank you. Okay, great. All right, well, let's go to a roll call vote. Um, Fred? Yes. Julie? Yes. Me? Yes. Okay. All right. The last one. Uh, point Eli Snow Rackley to the Waitley Housing Committee. Yeah, I, I don't know who he is either. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know either, but if somebody uh, knows him and is willing to say I something. Okay. I can right. speak to that. Um. Yeah, so unfortunately, Natalie Borden had to step down from the housing committee as their lease will be ending soon and they will be moving out of Waitley. Um, oh. Fortunately, I met Eli at about the same time that I learned about Natalie stepping down. He's also a Waitley resident who is a renter in town up near um, on, in West Waitley near the field station. Oh. Um, and he's very enthusiastic about joining the housing committee. So, okay. Um, yeah. All right. I'm done. I guess that's enough for me. Um, does anybody like to make a motion? I move the appointment of Eli Snow Rackley to the Waitley Housing Committee. I will second that. Okay, roll call vote. Fred? Yes. Julie? Yes. Joyce? Yep. Yeah. Okay, go well, congratulations, Ruth, Chris, and Eli. I look forward to, to hearing the results of your committees. So let me turn it over to Brian for town administrator updates. Before, before Brian, it was one thing I oh. meant to bring up under the COFRS. Is that oh, okay. a, a tracking thing on funds that have been spent and appropriated and or obligated and spent so far? If there's money that's obligated and not spent, that the project comes in under budget, where does that money? I mean, you can't go back into CLFRS because that's not our money to put money into the account. In that, would it go back to free cash? Well, the, the money isn't, the money really isn't appropriated in the sense of the, uh, the town meeting sense. It's, it's, um, it's spent at the uh, expenditure of the, of the approval of the select board. So um, it would really just be a, I think, I get would it just stay in that account? Yeah, it, stays it, it would never account. have moved out of that account. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's still in there. We would and um actually that's a great segue for a question I I, I received today. Um there's a request from the um speaking of leftover funds, there's yeah. a request from the school to uh, uh if they could continue their foreign projects beyond the ones that you know the board had approved. Um, I think we should talk about that at another meeting, but just food for thought as to which project the foreign ones. That I oh, so, right, yeah. What, what I'm hearing you say is the school has a foreign project. No, it's it's yeah, that's what I thought I heard too. Flooring. Flooring. Okay. Flooring. F L O O R I N G. Okay. So All right. Under seventeen thousand spend is that mid project or is that project done and payment under budget? The elementary school? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, they're done with what they said okay. they were going to do. So in essence, we can re, we can add back $5,400 to available CLM funds. Yeah. Yeah. 
as opposed to the FTP intestine, which I assume we still might want to spend at some point and move that over rather than returning those funds. <coughs> okay. All right, town administrator updates. Um, I'll do mine and then Hannah can do hers. So um, I guess we should, that'd be more efficient. The uh, town hall window issue update with the sort of that iridescent staining that's happening. We had um, it tested for, you know, if it was biologically caused, uh, it appears to be that it's not biological caused. There was some, um, whatever you want to call it, not residual, mold or you know it's they're left to find a little bit mold um, in a closed space like that uh, but it's likely not uh, biologically caused so um next steps we're gonna have to reach back out to the the window manufacturer and um figure out next steps um, so so it's a discoloration in the lamination or something yeah like that there's different theories as to what's causing it um so that, that'll be the next step there um I received an inquiry about the Mayo property um, from a real estate agent. And wow. <laughs> that's a news um, flash. Yeah. And so the inquiry was, you know, would the would the town be willing to sell the property? Um, and I said that I would ask the select board if they would be open to exploring it. So shall we explore it? Question mark. Mm. Well, I know there have been just different ideas have come up um, about how to use that property. And uh, I'm trying to remember exactly what they were, but I was, I know we we may need a new highway garage at some point. That was at least a candidate location. Um, uh, I may not be aware of other things, other ideas people had talked about for that property. That's the one idea on the table that I'm aware of. Yeah. yeah, it hasn't gone very far uh, as far as sorting out whether the site is appropriate and so on. Talking. Correct. Correct. Okay. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Any idea what they want to put there? Uh, my understanding is they'll be looking to uh, put in office space. Oh. Or what particular kind of? Um, I don't know. And given that it's not out for offer, any idea of what they would kind of money they might? Be I I didn't get that part of the discussion. Okay. But I, I... It's um is it it is owned commercial though, already right? So. So commercial uses would be fine and um, no. Well, that's very interesting. If we, um, this is a sort of a, a what if question, um, but if we decided we want to sell that property, what's the procedure? I assume we get, we would want to know what the plot is worth. We didn't need to get a, not an assessor, the other one, the one that real estate people use um, appraiser. appraiser that's right um get an appraisal presumably they would get an appraisal and yeah. you start um entering into some kind of negotiation hmm. it, that's it, it, really may, interesting. it may actually still need to be a um uh, uh, a competitive you know a competitive bid process right yeah um, or the competitive bid process or uh, I have a question into Lynn about, I, I believe that that property is a tax foreclosure property way back yeah. then. So it, it could also be subject to a, a, just an option. Oh. As a possibility. Right. Hmm. Well, that's really interesting. Because, you know, if you'd asked me the day before you emailed me the, the uh, agenda last week, uh, if you'd asked me that uh, what was going to happen with the DeMaio property, I think it's going to be the same as the last year and the previous year and the previous year. It's just going to sit there and, and do a great job with the snowmobile parking in the winter. But 
wow, this is kind of out of the blue. I think we have to probably consider it. We'll be uh, considered for. Yeah, the, when the movie set it up the street. Yeah. There. Yeah. yeah, it's true. Does the town need to consider whether it's useful for us? So that's where the so possible the highway department. Yeah, the first highway garage. Right. What is it? Some kind of assessment of whether that's a good place for us to put a highway garage prior to yeah, this Friday. Yeah, that's yeah. Whether it's in the it or not. In three preliminary discussions with Keith, then we need three to. Three preliminary. Brad and I have already had some conversation over that. Just, you know, we talked about needing to talk. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we won't go any further yet. Yeah, I think the inquiry from the realtor is also very preliminary as well. It's sort huh. of the casting a wide net of. I think it was a, a certain, a certain, you know, mm. mile long and, and a certain place. Do, do they recognize that only has a lot of building? <laughs> right, and that's one thing that I feel we need to potentially iron out a little bit more is actually seeing what is usable on that property. Yeah, get, getting and that. We need the commissioning a survey to, that tells us exactly what yeah. the wetlands need to be delineated, and the conservation commission has got to say this is how many square feet you got to work with. Yeah. Because uh, the last thing we want to do is go down the road of building a, a highway department, and then you know the, there's a lot of outside area that the highway department needs for storage and things like that. Yeah. And if, he or been told you can't you can't put those materials there on that because that's wetland. And then, so there's all these things need to be ironed out. Right. And I feel that's that's in our situation, our responsibility for us, but yet for an outside real estate agent, the burden is on them, not us. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then there are, as far as the town goes, they're also intangible costs of if we want to put a highway department there and we you know there's enough space and everything what is the how do you translate into money the utility of then getting the use of the land that the current highway department is on mm -hmm. to for some other usage whether it's expanding transfer mm -hmm. station or I, it's not a simple calculation right. though. yeah what mm -hmm. what land for well, I guess then, I mean, it sounds like we really need to um, think about it a little bit, but I guess if they were the real estate agent were to call back, you could say they didn't say hell no, <laughs> that, that we were at least open to considering it, but we want to maybe get a little more information about, you know, what's really buildable there and um, might it serve some of our purposes. Does that seem like a reasonable summary of our short discussion? Yep. Um, the center school RFP. Um, I received the sample lease from our town council uh, today. Um, so I think that's something that we could add uh, more in depth discussion with the um, have at the next meeting. Okay. Water merger borrowing. Um, the water commissioner is going to be borrowing around 150,000, I believe. Um, and we'll have those loan documents for the for the select board to sign um, at the next meeting. Currently, Wynn's working with our financial consultant to get that out the bid. So that means they're taking in about 50,000 in fees. Um, we have to, we have pay we have to pay back 220 plus interest. Okay. So uh, that, yeah. Um, or should, um, and the only other one I have here, um, so Complete Streets Project um, open house meeting um, is going to be on October 6th um, from 6 to 8 p.m. It's going to be similar to the one that we've had previously, um, so it's going to be an open house style meeting. We'll have plans and um, about the um, sidewalk extensions, finishing up the sidewalks on Chestnut Plain Road, um, a sidewalk extension at the elementary school. And then um, 
a couple uh, traffic improvements in West Whaley. Um, so we'll have some plans that people can come see. Um, and if they want to come talk to us about it as well and have questions answered, um, they can come anytime between six and eight. There's not going to be, you know, a presentation starting at six and it's going to go to whenever. It's just sort of open and people can come as, as, they, as they can. Um, and, I, and I think the rest are yours. Awesome. Uh, hopefully these will be relatively quick. So uh, the first one, I have a connection at the Conway School. Um, she's the project manager. She and I are having lunch tomorrow to discuss potential projects. Um, because they are getting so close to their deadline, the winter projects, they offered to potentially do some work pro bono. She didn't make any promises, but she said that it might be an option. Um, and they're looking to do planning projects specifically. Um, she offered a climate resilience plan, for example, or a watershed analysis of water quality for Wheatley. Um, so I think this could be something that would be nice to have for the town of Wheatley. It's not necessarily a need right now. I think that we have the capacity to do it. And if it's free, um, it might be a good idea, but it, this is, it's just an option to consider for the select board. Okay. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about that or if you want to hear the other update. Um, um, I, I mean, I'd like to find out after your lunch, I guess. Great. <laughs> awesome. Uh, okay, so we may hear back. You'll, you'll know more then. Right now, it'd be kind of speculating, right? Yeah. Do you have any preference for, for example, the climate resilience plan versus the watershed plan? Any ideas for specific directions that you'd like me to recommend? Very curious about watershed. Cool. Yeah. yeah. But I'm also also we. I remember being on the like kind of the uh, municipal vulnerability. You know, all those various meetings we had to talk about what we thought. Um, having an outsider's perspective on well, uh, they're not all that outside, right? But like, what kind of things ought we be looking at for resiliency? Is also a, a not just for water, but for uh, other services, electric, for all kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, I'll ask more then about the options available and see what she says. Okay. Cool. Um, and then the other update is about MVP. So there are three parts to this update. First, solar. We're still in the process of developing the RFP. I um, Everybody responded to the survey today for the Energy Committee. Um, and it looks like the best time for us to meet is on October 5th. I'm hoping that's the meeting where we'll be able to um, dial down into what our priorities for are for the RFP. Um, like I said before, maximizing energy output or uh, rooftop uh, mm. coverage. Um, so those invitations in the agenda will be going out tomorrow. Um, I also had meetings with Claire Chang from Greenfield Solar and Zara Dowling from UMass. Um, they were great for clarifying the incentive structure. We're eligible for SMART. Zara gave me the um, calculator and helped walk me through it. So I have an, a rough understanding of the um, amounts that we would be eligible for through SMART. Um, they both also offered to read over the RFP, but they didn't have any leads for actual RFP documents that we could copy. So we're still kind of working from the ground up with that one. <laughs> okay. Um, Hitchcock Center though, awesome news. We had our kickoff meeting. Everything is going very smoothly. The lessons are gonna happen on October 26th and November 2nd. The field trip is happening on November 9th. I'm extremely excited. Um, community outreach for that will include backpack mailers for the fourth grade students. Um, and we're on track. Do you get to go? Yeah, um, they invited me. So I'm hoping to go. I would love to go. Yeah. Um, and then last part is the community outreach plan. So um, it's really starting to begin in earnest. We have some social media draft posts that are about to go out. Um, we put the scoop article out um, and I'm planning on tabling at the fall festival this upcoming weekend. Um, in order to do that, I'm gonna create a few pamphlets so that people can kind of take and read at their leisure for an overview of the activities planned um, and then provide opportunities for feedback. All right, very good. All right. Um, 
So that's it for town administrator updates. Brian, you didn't like think of something while Hannah was speaking? Nope, okay. All right, are there any items not anticipated? Okay, seeing none, I would entertain a motion. Would you? Call second. Um, those in favor, Fred? Yes. Julie? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Great, thanks everybody.